We continue today in Luke's Gospel for this season of the lectionary year, the second Sunday in Advent. These words, interesting words from Luke, if you remember how Luke starts his Gospel of the desire to write a historical orderly account, as he calls it. It's always interesting to hear how detailed Luke can be. Today we hear these words from the third chapter, verses 1 through 6. Luke says, In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. John went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Some people say that it's nostalgia. Some say that the season's way overdone. Some say we're stuck in the past, particularly us baby boomers. But I have a hunch that in a world becoming increasingly alien and strange to many people and probably to many of us, at least there's Christmas. And one of the things most attractive to us about Christmas is that we can soak ourselves, at least for a little while, in the familiar. You, you know what I'm talking about. Their familiar customs and traditions, their familiar decorations. We finally got our Advent wreath up this week and had our usual conversation about whether the, the red bow and the ribbon go at the top of the wreath or the bottom of the wreath. <laughs> They're wonderful, familiar sounds and smells and foods. We like party mix at Christmas at our house. I'm the official party mix maker for the season. Certainly there's candle tea and the puts, there are carols. I have to confess that each Advent, I have one of these old cheesy, that's what the kids call it, CDs of Christmas music. I carry it around and play it to myself in the truck during the weeks before Christmas. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Winter Wonderland and Santa Claus is coming to town. Dean Martin. <laughs> Lena Horn. Bean Crosby. You know what I mean. And of course, there are the gatherings of family and friends. In my family growing up, we spent every Christmas Day evening at my grandparents' farm. Aunts and uncles. Lots of cousins, potluck supper, silly games, exchanging $3 gifts that you had to wrap up and put woman's gift or man's gift. Our own parents usually brought what we got as children, but we didn't know it. Such fun at Christmas, so, so very familiar. What are some of your images and traditions and customs for Christmas. Well, in the midst of even familiar biblical people and images of Christmas, Mary and Joseph, the stable with its animals and its manger, shepherds, angels, wise men, there comes 
on this second Sunday of Advent, this unfamiliar one. The one who's been preaching around the Jordan. The voice crying out in the wilderness. The one who tells us fairly plainly in this season that there is no Advent. There is no real Christmas without preparation. His name is John. He's the son of Zechariah who served as a priest in the temple. Luke says his birth, his birth was announced just like Jesus' birth by an angel. They said he had the spirit and the power of Elijah. But evidently he was a strange sort of fella. Matthew said that he wore clothing made out of camel's hair, a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He was rough and intense, and I suppose you have to be rough and intense if you live in the wilderness. And evidently, John had quite a following. He's not a cuddly Advent kind of guy at all. He's not someone that you would put in a puts very well. I mean, just when we're ready for peace on earth and goodwill to all, to all he starts talking about repentance and sins. Just when we've survived another Black Friday again and we're looking for a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, he's talking about preparing the way of the Lord with crooked ways straight and rough ways smooth. It gets even worse next week when we're here another week when we want to hear Gloria in excelsis Deo and John will start talking about a brood of vipers and cutting down trees that don't bear fruit and giving away your clothes and collecting taxes. I think he would have to run as an independent John the Baptist is an unfamiliar guy, full of hard words and images of Jesus not easily recognizable in our cardboard manger scene. Yet, says Luke, we don't get to Christmas without going through the wilderness region of the Jordan. We don't get to Christmas without hearing the call to prepare. We don't get to Christmas, not really, unless we listen to the one who in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, heard the word of God. And what is the word of God for this time of Advent and preparation? John says it is repentance. The Lord of life is coming and we always need to, to repent when we face that reality. The Lord of life is about to be born and things aren't going to be the same anymore. The Lord of life is coming into the world and now all flesh shall see the salvation of God. I don't know. In our day, I think the word repentance is so unfamiliar to us this time of year because we've always seen it as something we should feel bad over. We did something wrong, and certainly it can be that. But John's message in Luke isn't, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. No, the word of God that comes to John when he preaches repentance means something different. It means to turn one's heart and mind to a new attitude, to a new expectation, to a new direction, to a new understanding of what God is doing in the world, in my life, and in your life, through Christ. It's the same message that Jesus himself preached when he began his public ministry. You see, 
turning our hearts and minds to a new attitude and expectation and seeing this Advent season as a time of preparation, that's a repentance I know that I need. And I need it because I need God to help me make sense of my life and of the things I experience and I encounter in it. I need God to help me make sense of things, to establish a faith that faces the world, the world I live in, with courage and hope and a strong belief that in Christ God has chosen to reconcile the world to himself. I need this kind of repentance because without a new attitude and expectation, I'm likely to be overwhelmed by the human pain and suffering I see all around me. I don't know about you, but I'm likely to become disillusioned or even cynical and afraid to respond. Robin Cole tells of a young 22-year-old nurse just out of nursing school and working at her first job in a nursing home in a small town in the Midwest. Three days before Christmas, she is asked to help with a somewhat difficult patient whose name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth has lived in the home for a long time. She constantly roams the halls in a tired old chenille robe pull tightly around her thin waist. And when she passes anyone or is spoken to by anyone, she always says, doop, doop. The nurses know that Elizabeth never does anyone any harm, that evidently she has no family to speak of, and they assume that when she says doop, doop, she thinks she's saying words. On the day before Christmas Eve, the young nurse decides she is going to try something different. When Elizabeth makes one of her many passes through the halls by the nurse's station, the nurse says to her, Elizabeth, I want you to help me with something, to which Elizabeth replies, doop, doop. They go to the day room. They find a piece of paper and a pencil. And the nurse says, Elizabeth, can you write your name for me? Elizabeth looked confused and troubled. So the nurse said, here, I'll write it for you first, and then you can copy it, okay? So she wrote Elizabeth in large script. Then she said, you stay here and copy this, and I'll be right back. She walked back to the nurse's station and said, Elizabeth is writing. Well, don't leave her too long, said the charge nurse. And oh, by the way, two of the other nurses who were supposed to work tomorrow on Christmas Eve and also on Christmas Day are sick. I know that you had planned to be off, but I, I need you here. The young nurse swallowed hard. She had never been away from her family on Christmas. When she moved away from her family and came to this place and took the job, she had assumed she could go home for the holidays. So rather sadly, she walked back to the day room where Elizabeth sat staring at the writing paper in front of her on the table. When she saw the nurse coming, she said with satisfaction, <clears throat> doop, doop, and handed her the paper that she had written on. It said, Elizabeth, in big, bold, somewhat wobbly writing. Later that night, the young nurse told the charge nurse about what had happened. She said she wondered if tomorrow on Christmas Eve she could take Elizabeth out for a little while. Patients were often taken for walks around the nursing home, taken to places by visitors and others. The young nurse said, I want to take Elizabeth to the Christmas Eve service at the church down the street. After thinking about it, the charge nurse said, well, Things would be easier around here if you did take her. Then when you get back, you can get her ready for bed. 
A lot of others have visitors this time of year, but she doesn't have anyone. I'll ask the doctor what he says. So it was that a first-year nurse and a skinny elderly lady arrived at First Church on Christmas Eve. The nurse told Elizabeth that she didn't know how much she would understand about the service, but they would just sit down and be with the rest of the people. There would be music and reading and children dressed in costumes. Elizabeth replied, doop doop. Then the choir entered, beginning the service, the Christmas story was read. The children acted out the story. And after a while, the lights were dimmed and the organ introduced Silent Night. The nurse handed Elizabeth a hymnal, but Elizabeth refused to take it. And the nurse began to be anxious and wondered if Elizabeth would take off down the aisle like she did back in the home. So the nurse sang as loud as she could, hoping to attract Elizabeth's attention. When suddenly she heard this thin, crackling voice singing, Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. It was Elizabeth. Eyes staring straight ahead, looking at the candles burning, singing the words without consulting the hymnal. Christ the Savior is born, she sang. Christ the Savior is born. That young nurse said later that she thought to herself, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, give me your eyes. Help me to see everyone as you see them in this season, as your children, as your beloved, people of worth and people of purpose. Leaving the church that night after the service, the nurse held on to Elizabeth's arm and patted her gently and said, Merry Christmas, Elizabeth. She said Elizabeth looked back at her and smiled contentedly and said, doop, doop. My friends, the word of God came to John. The Lord of life is coming and we need to repent. We need to turn our hearts and minds to a new attitude, to a new expectation, to a new direction this season. I think this is worthy preparation for this Advent, if not for every Advent. This is worthy preparation for the one who is to come, so that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. What that particular turn of heart and mind or new expectation or new direction is might be different for every one of us in this room. Yet it is preparation we are called to make. And Christians of faith have been answering that call from the unfamiliar figure in Advent since the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee. Amen.